when Fred Rogers, man, it chokes me up. <laughs> when Fred Rogers was 23 years old, he had a degree in music composition, was planning to enter seminary and become a Presbyterian minister. He went home to his parents on Easter vacation and saw his first television show. I saw people, this is him quoting, I'm quoting him. I saw people doing the most demeaning things to other people on that television. And I just announced to my family, I think I'll go into television. <laughs> his parents were astounded. His mother exclaimed, you have never seen a television before. And Fred Rogers replied, I have seen enough of it to think maybe I could do something with it, something positive. So he went, he did not go to seminary then. He went to New York City. He began producing and directing shows for NBC. He also helped set up the first community sponsored public broadcasting station in the country, WQED in Pittsburgh. He did attend seminary in his spare time. He was ordained a minister, saying, and I quote, he was called to continue my ministry to children and families through mass media. He was the first television, he wasn't really, well, he was an evangelist. He didn't try to convert people, but he was first television minister. He married Joanne, who was a concert pianist. Together they raised two sons. When I first gave this message 14 years ago, he was 72 years old and still married to Joanne. I, I, I can't do the math anymore. I have five degrees, I have five years of, of uh, college math, but I can't do that math. You can figure it out. When asked about his interest in children and his ability to connect with them through story and song, he replied, I was an only child for the first 11 years of my life, and I had to make up a lot of my friends. I had lots of playtime. I don't think I ever had imaginary friends in the classic sense of the word, but I had elaborate play. In the early days of public television, he and one of the secretaries at WQED decided to do a children program in their spare time. They got busy with the program. By the way, what was the name of that program? It was, no, this is before that. This was, this was on public television. It's called the Children's Corner. But they got so busy with this in their spare time, they had to give it up and, and concentrate on the show. I wasn't on the camera at all those first seven years, he said. I just did the puppets. Did you know he, just, he was behind the scenes doing puppets? And you didn't see Mr. Rogers for seven years. I ran back and forth between the organ. He was not only a great p a pianist, he was also a great organist. And the puppets. So he would, you know, he would play the organ and run behind do the puppets. It was not until he stepped in front of the camera that the show he had been doing for all these decades was born. By the way, he, at the, when, he, when he taped the final story about, about 2001, he had done more than 1,000 shows. Once upon a time, a long time ago, a man took off his jacket and put on a sweater. Then he took off his shoes, put on a pair of sneakers. His name was Mr. Fred Rogers. He was stepping in front of the camera as Mr. Rogers, and he wanted to do everything right. And whatever he did right, he wanted to repeat. And so once upon a time, Fred Rogers took off his jacket, put on a sweater. His mother had made him, by the way, a cardigan with a zipper. These are not authentic. He put on navy blue pair of boating sneakers. These are blue slippers. He did the same thing the next day and the next until he had done the same thing 1,000 times. Now here is a paradox. Mr. Rogers never watched television except for that first exposure. He didn't watch television. There are some wonderful things on television, but he strongly recommended that if small children watch television, they do so only with their parents. Mr. Rogers said, and I quote, if children are going to see things like the news, they have got to have an adult by them who can say, well, people in that family might do that kind of thing, but that kind of behavior does not go on in our family. 
that is very important because part, this is what, this is still Mr. Rogers, that is very important because parents bring the TV into their, into their home and so the kids assume that everything on there is okay by their parents. Look at what parents, the, the one on to say is kind of like a refrigerator. He said, look at what the parents put inside the refrigerator. Look at what they let you watch on television. Certainly children do not expect them to put poison in the refrigerator. That is why I think producers and purveyors of TV have a much greater responsibility than that they really care to assume. I have always considered a big responsibility to bring materials into people's homes. Mr. Roger took it all very seriously, and he spent a lot of time in his life doing what he calls, quote, mighty serious study with kids, unquote. The key is with kids. He didn't study kids, he studied with kids. The key to his ability to engage children came from his relationship with children, which was enabled by his valuing the child within himself. That's what he would say. The reason I can relate to children I can value the child within myself. I think the most challenging thing is to be able to touch the child within yourself. I relish the time I spend with children. Children always touch me. By the way, if you had been here a couple of months ago, and Dan, when uh, I, I, Interim Minister Gary Kowalski and Danny and some other men did the, did the service, that cover today is the same cover that he used then. And Danny talked about that little child you see had cerebral palsy plus other and, and you see Mr. Rogers right up to him? So, once he was asked by ophthalmologists, eye doctors, to, to, to write a chapter in their book about children. So sometimes they have to take, this is what he, so Rogers says, sometimes they have to take care of the eyes of children, and some children get very scared. Because they know their world disappears when their eyes close. And they can be afraid that the ophthalmologist will make their eyes closed forever. They did not want to scare children, so they asked Mr. Rogers for help, and he agreed to write a chapter in the book for ophthalmologists. He began the chapter by addressing the first sentence to the doctors themselves. You were a child once. Mr. Rogers' make-believe television programs were a vehicle for reaching children in meaningful ways. Make-believe is a microcosm of reality, said Mr. Rogers, in which people can work out things in a playful way. I have seen so many kids play in ways that were supportive of their own growing up. I have seen kids reenact really traumatic episodes in their lives in their play, and over and over again work one facet or another through in their play. In the presence of an accepting adult who can create kinds of limits that can help them be comfortable in doing so, such a thing, play can be therapeutic. In, in fact, there are people trained in, in play therapy with children for this very reason. One thing we do in the neighborhood that I think is helpful is to let people know that feelings are mentionable. And if we want to manage them, then we really need to mention them. So one of his shows, for example, dealt with anger. He knew that small children are always afraid of loss. They are afraid that they may lose their parents, for example, if the parents are angry with them. So Mr. Rogers helped them see that anger is a feeling and that it is okay to express your feelings and that we can do that in good ways. So when someone is angry with us, it does not mean we lose their love. He presented his theology of love and anger through story puppets, song, and play. In 2001, I asked my 12-year-old advisor, who was, a member, who was part of our church, Jacob Sokolar, and I was supposedly mentoring him, but believe me, he taught me more than I, than, than I ever could teach him. I watched him, have, do you watch, did you watch Mr. Rogers when you were a trial? By the way, he was 11 years old. I said, did you watch the, Mr. Rogers? And he says, He's, oh yeah, I did. I watched him when I was four or five years old, and I remember the best of all the puppets in the trolley and trolley land. He also said he was aware back then, this is a very bright young man, that Mr. Always, Mr. Rogers was always trying to teach a moral lesson. He found that part boring, 
So he said, I ignored that. I told him when he is an adult, he will remember and be surprised how much he remembers and has integrated into his life. I went to Jacob's wedding a couple of years ago, so I've, I want to catch up with him now and f- find out if this is indeed true. By the way, he, he got a doctorate in birds. His wife got a doctorate in insects. And it was a Quaker wedding, and so while well, somebody got up, you know, you, in a Quaker wedding, you get up when you moved, and, you, and when God moves you, and this person got up and said, Jacob, you're into birds. Rebecca, you're into, into insects. Remember, birds eat insects. Once upon, once upon a time, there was a boy who did not like himself very much. It was not his fault. He was born with cerebral palsy. That's the kid on the, on the cover there. Cerebral palsy is something that happens to the brain. It means you can think clearly, but sometimes you have difficulty with motions, walking or talking, for example. And this boy had a very bad case of cerebral palsy, and he was a very small boy. Some people took advantage of him, did some things to him that made him think he was a bad little boy. When he became a teenager, he had hit himself hard and tell his mother he did not want to live anymore, for he was sure that God did not like him and what was inside of him. He grew up watching... (coughs) He grew up watching Mr. Rogers on TV... And even at the age of 14, he still loved watching Mr. Rogers. So his mother called Mr. Rogers and said, come visit. He always did, by the way. If you called Mr. Rogers, and he he would come to your house if he was there to do a show. He was so nervous that when Mr. Rogers did visit, he got mad at himself and began hitting himself again. And his mother had to take him out of the room to have a talk with him and try to calm him down. Mr. Rogers did not leave. He wanted something from the boy. And Mr. Rogers never leaves when he wants something from somebody. So he just waited patiently. When the boy came back, he said, I want you to do something for me. Would you do something for me? By the way, the, the kid needed a computer to communicate at that time, and the, the, the kid said, of course I'll do something for you. And then Mr. Rogers said, I'd like you to pray for me. Will you pray for me? Now, the boy was thunderstruck. Nobody had ever asked him for something at all. The boy had always been prayed for. He told Mr. Rogers he would try, and ever since that, He kept Mr. Rogers in his prayer every day and does not talk about wanting to die anymore (coughs) because he figured Mr. Rogers is close to God and if Mr. Rogers likes him, God must like him too. As for Mr. Rogers, he said, I asked him to pray for me because I think anyone who has gone through what he has gone through must be very close to God. I asked him because I wanted his prayers for me. The best thing we can realize, says Mr. Rogers, is that we are lovable, we are capable of loving. If we can come out of any phrase in our lives with that as part of us, we'll do very well. So this is what Mr. Rogers' ministry was all about, was trying to get kids to see that they not only were lovable, but they could love. Every day, Mrs. Rogers refused to do anything that would make his weight change. You might not know this about him. He was really fanatic about his weight. He never drank, never smoked, and he ate, never ate meat of any kind. And when he went to bed at night, He never slept late in the morning. He didn't watch television. And every morning when he swam, he swam every morning, he stepped on a scale in his bathing suit, bathing cap, goggles, and the scale tells him he weighs 143 pounds. 
The number 143, this is cool, isn't it? means I love you. It takes one letter to say I, four to say love, three to say you, 143, I love you. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? This is, that was quoting him. Here is a description of Mr. Rogers taken from a book. Somebody wrote a biography about him. This is a typical Mr. Rogers day. He has already gotten up at 5.30. He already prayed for all the children who have asked him for his prayers, which were, were, were legion. He already read. He already wrote. He already swam. Already weighed himself. Already sent out cards for birthdays. Remember when you sent out birthday cards and you didn't do email? It was a birthday. He wrote out the cards. He already called any number of people who defended up on him for comfort. He would call kids and, and talk to them. And he already cried when he read the letter of a mother whose child was buried with a picture of him in his casket. He already played for 20 minutes with an autistic boy who has come with his father all the way from Boise, Idaho, to meet him. The boy had never spoken until one day he said, X the Owl, X the Owl, which is one of the names of Mr. Rogers' puppets. And he had never looked at his father in the eye until one day his father said, let's go to the neighborhood and make believe. And now the boy is speaking and reading. The father has come to thank Mr. Rogers for saving his son's life. And by this time, he is, it is 30, 9.30 in the morning, time to take off his jacket and his shoes, start taping another visit to the neighborhood. He wrote all his own scripts. In other words, the Mr. Rogers you saw on television is the real Mr. Rogers. Unlike most television personalities, he didn't have two lives, the one you saw on television and this other one. His whole life was cut of one fabric. Unlike most TV personalities, Mr. Rogers did not have a TV life and his real life, which were different. And unlike most TV personalities, Mr. Rogers does not shield himself from the public. He travels among people, traveled among people, talked with people, he'd met people all the way through his life. One time when he was taping a show in New York City, he was caught in the rain. He did not have an umbrella, so he ducked into the subway and got on one of the trains. It was late in the day, and the train was crowded with children who were coming home from school, kids of all races, mostly black and Latino, and they did not even approach Mr. Rogers and ask him for his autograph. They sang. They sang all at once, all together, the song that Danny sang, the neighborhood song. Won't you be my neighbor? They sang, they sang to Mr. Rogers. And they turned the clattering train into a single, soft, runaway choir. In this letter to the church in Thessalonia, the Apostle Paul wrote, pray without ceasing. Now, I grew up a Baptist, and I could never wonder, how do you pray? What do you do? You stay on your knees and you pray all day? How do you do that? And I have a clear understanding of what Paul meant. He was asking us to make our lives a prayer. Not on our knees, but in our, all, all our life, our actions. That is how I saw Mr. Rogers. I don't see him as a perfect man. He was not a perfect man. He wasn't even unlike us. I see him as a fallible man who dedicated his life to praying without ceasing by ceaselessly loving and caring for children. And that is why I chose to talk about Mr. Rogers today. By the way, the other reason was because of the service that, that uh, Gary and, da and Dan, the other men, did. Much of what I shared with you today come from an article written in 1984 in an issue of Mothering Magazine. Mr. Rogers was also Mr. Mum. Make your life a prayer. Give some of yourself and your time and love to children. Be an agent of grace. Tom Junod, who was his biographer, spent several days with Mr. Rogers in order to write an article about him. I'll conclude with these word, words that Mr. Junod wrote. Once upon a time, a man named Fred Rogers decided he wanted to live in heaven. Heaven is the place where good people go when they die. But this man, Fred Rogers, did not want to go to heaven. He wanted to live in heaven, here and now, in this world. And so one day, when he was talking about all the people he had loved 
in this life, he looked at me and said, this is his biography, he looked at me and said, the connections we make and the courses of a life, maybe that is what heaven is. We make so many connections here on earth. Look at us. I have just met you. This is spent a couple of weeks with this guy. I just met you, but I'm invested in you, in who you are, who you will be, and I can't help it. We make so many connections on earth. Just look at us.